Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Marianne Guerra, CEO of BioXL. BioXL is a venture nonprofit dedicated to commercializing the discoveries coming out of Arizona's biomedical research community. Marianne was previously the executive director of the XPRIZE Foundation, CEO of TGen, and president of TGen Accelerators, as well as the manager for the National Institutes of Health's largest technology transfer program. Marianne has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Marianne, for joining us today. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Arizona decided purposefully to attract biomedical research and decided that one of the core foundations for economic growth was going to be in the healthcare field and in the biomedical genomics research uh, environment. Talk about how BioXL has uh, interacted with this environment uh, to create this, this, uh, this venture nonprofit. Arizona, I believe, really had a comprehensive and thoughtful approach. Uh, Ten years ago, they looked at what were the assets of Arizona um, in the biomedical field. The Flynn Foundation played a major role, a local um, organization that um, was dedicated to health care. And they looked and said, what were the assets? And they had assets in uh, diabetes and cancer and, and neuro. And then they looked at what was up and coming and genomics and proteomics was up and coming. And they laid out a roadmap and said, this is what we need to do. This is what how we need to leverage our assets. This is how we need to build a new economy, a knowledge-based economy for Arizona, because while we've got sunshine and, and blue skies and, and a lovely tourism um, you know, um, environment, we needed to do something more and look ahead to the future. They uh, put investment into the universities. They uh, put investment into TGen and getting TGen started here, the Translational Genomics Research Institute. And then um, they mapped that, and then they tracked it, and they looked at the milestones and said, OK, we've done that. Now the next thing we need to do is we need to create a, um, an environment to get these businesses going. So you, you build deal flow. Now you need to translate that deal flow into real products and real companies, and then really build your industry here, your new industry sector. And so when we looked at that, we said, OK, we did good on part one. But where's part two? Because Phoenix doesn't have, and Arizona's not known for their venture community, and um, they don't have and didn't have a large biotech community to build on. So we looked at that and said, OK, how do we, again, play on what assets we have? Uh, BioXL was formed to just fit in that niche. Uh, you hear the valley of death, and you know what better place to create an organization dedicated to the valley of death than Phoenix, Arizona. So then we look at how do we work with universities and research performing institutes, um, local medical centers, how do we take those ideas that have moved along far enough that have commercial potential, put them through proof of concept to make sure that they actually do have commercial potential, and then seed the companies um, to um, provides uh, business uh, support, technical support around them so that they can have a greater chance of success. We felt if we did that, created the companies, made stronger early stage companies, hopefully that would then start to attract the venture community who would want to fund in companies that maybe were a little bit less risk but still early stage. What I find to be very interesting is this idea of a nonprofit organization working to commercialize mm -hmm. Um, research. Talk about the role of nonprofits. Why is a nonprofit even necessary? Uh, if, if research has merit, if it is commercializable, um, why would it be important to have a nonprofit? Shouldn't investors step in to that breach as they have traditionally? Uh, that, that's a really good question, and uh, we get that question all the time: Is why are you a nonprofit? And we're a nonprofit because uh, the venture world does step in, but they step in later. Um, over the last ten years, they want less risk, they want greater profit. And so, if you look at uh, technology coming out of a university, it's the highest risk. I mean, universities are facing situations where uh, pharma, biotech won't even license their research outcomes because they're still high risk or they want to license them for low royalties and the universities don't want to do that. And the reason is is because they haven't gone through proof of concept. They haven't been validated. Nobody's looked at the business market. Nobody's assessed really whether their IP has strength. There's a lot of patents that come out of universities that are 
that are patented, but there's competing patents where they don't have freedom to operate. So just saying, oh, I have a great invention, oh, I have a patent, doesn't really mean anything. I mean, what means something is you have a patent and you have um, freedom to operate and you have a market and the cost of manufacturing that good um, allows you to make a profit. Um, those are things that um, don't enter into research. And you know, as we look at the scientists that come out of a research environment and now start a new company, you know, and you talk about okay, cash flow. Well, what's cash flow? You know, I just spend and grant money comes in. No, no, no. You actually have to have money in the bank to pay your bills along the way. Um, when you talk about okay, what the manufacturing is, they don't necessarily understand that. You know, they've got to figure out you know, design a uh, prototype, get the cost down, how much is it going to cost, how much is the sales and marketing going to cost, what's your regulatory approach? Because in the life sciences, you've got FDA, and it's not even good enough to get a 510K approval if it's a biomedical device or have FDA approval if you don't have, uh, these days, having reimbursement. You talk about why this is so hard, you walk out of a research lab and you find, you know, you're the founder of a company and you're all excited, you've got this great technology, it's got a patent, and now you have to finish the research, you have to raise the investment capital, you have to move that along into sales and marketing, have it manufactured, have it distributed, and all of a sudden it's like, you know, we talk about it, you walk out the door and you fall off a, you know, a 50,000, you know, uh, foot cliff. So does that mean that this complexity and the expense and the process, it, it makes it such a daunting task that for, for somebody who has money to invest, it might be, ironically, a more rational decision to take aspirin, put it into a new package and sell it, than to take a new patented approach to treatment and invest millions of dollars, perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars, and end up perhaps with nothing. So th this nonprofit actually creates a greater breathing room to allow that case to be made for the investor. So you're acting as a buffer to advance the process in places where investors would not yet take a stand. That's for, for exactly it. correct. And, and the reason we are a nonprofit is because the venture world wasn't going there and the government wasn't going there. The NIH, um, $30 billion a year, but its investigator initiated research. You look at the SBIR program out of the government and you have to have a company already. And you actually have to... The SBIR uh, is a small to? business innovation research okay. uh, grant and it's government sponsored, it's great money because it's non-dilutive dollars that come from the government to advance small businesses. But you have to have a business, you have to show data that you're successful, and these, comp these technologies just coming into potential commercialization, just ideas, don't have that yet. And so how do we get it out of there? How do we leverage that $30 billion that NIH is uh, investing every year? and get it into the market. So we stepped in as the nonprofit and we said, okay, we've got philanthropers out here that hopefully, when I've worked with philanthropers, they really want to see an outcome. They want to see their money do good. They want to leave a legacy. And so we thought, what better way of leaving a legacy than taking research assets, helping find solutions to difficult healthcare problems, creating companies that create economic, positive economic impact, jobs. In Arizona, your kids can graduate from ASU now or U of A and stay here locally because we've created jobs. I mean, the, the, the significance of what we're doing and the potential impact is pretty exciting. And, um, but I don't think it could be done as a for-profit. I mean, I think it has to be done as a non-profit because nobody wants to take the risk. We even talked to our board because, you know, we, we fund companies and, you know, then they're going through these growing pains and it's like, oh, what if they're not successful? And I say, well, there's a good chance that they won't be because we're taking risks no one else in the United States will take. Now, the government has started, the Economic uh, Development Agency has started to put some dollars into this space and trying to help incubators and accelerators, and, and that's really good. They're finally understanding that you're not going to get from point A to point C unless something is done 
you know, in between. And so um, I think we were ahead of our time thinking about how to use philanthropy and how to drive this. Um, I think that we do have a model that's a national model. I think every state needs to have bioexcels and um, energy excels. I mean, because this problem isn't just in the life sciences. This is a problem that um, impacts all uh, translation from research into commercialization. Well, it strikes me that you are basically doing what we used to do through the development of government agencies. So, you know, I think back to uh, NASA mm -hmm. and how that was developed as a uh, safe place for investment in cutting edge technologies that were not going to be immediately commercializable. And what you have is a, an approach that takes the benefits of that type of risk ameliorating um, uh, uh, structure, uh, but you privatized it. Yeah, absolutely, and I think staying focused, being very results oriented, um, measuring whether we're meeting our milestones, being accountable, uh, I think those are all part of the value system that we've set up. Over the last few years in the United States, faced some real issues with the integrity of our financial markets and financial institutions and um, you know folks that are involved in, in businesses and as we create these businesses we start them from some of them from scratch some we invest in that are you know early early but when you start them from scratch you try to create that element of what's the right way of doing things and you know um, you know how do you create the right type of agreements and fairness and you know integrity as a basis for these organizations and the being fair to all the players all the players profit without integrity as we saw with Bernie Madoff is is nothing it, it, it ends in tears and ashes yeah. so you have we so you and you have to build that in there and, and just from the very beginning um, inspire people to um, you know want to do good and do well and and that that that's okay as long as you do it the right way. So we believe that hopefully we're also creating a new breed of entrepreneurs that um, understand that that's an important piece of um, their business model. Um, and I think, you know, again, as a nonprofit, um, when we say that, we can say that. You know, sometimes when we're negotiating with the venture folks and, and we, and they'll say, well, why did you do that? And we'll say, because, you know, it was, we felt was the right thing to do for the founders. We could have a better agreement in place where we make more money, but is that the right thing to do? You know, um, and so we really walk a balance of, um, you know, yes, these are the, the typical business approaches. You get two times your investment, or three times your investment, or four times your investment. But you need to do that. You know, is one times your business investment enough? You know, and so those are some of the the. Um, the philosophical discussions that we have at BioXL to make sure that you know we're doing good business deals, deals that are investable on the back end, but also are really good for those founders, so that we you know we build um, a greater you know this issue of the haves and the have-nots. Um, I have no problem with every the haves. I just want to have more of the have-nots have. This isn't about figuring out how to extract knowledge for personal benefit. It's about how do you create partnerships so that the, the people who develop the knowledge also benefit so they can develop more right. knowledge, exactly. as well as the business people who are contributing their expertise. Yep, and a model for youth. I mean, you know, the, the, the youth of this country need to have role models. We need to have creative ideas and be supportive and be rewarded and um, see other entrepreneurs that have done that. So that education is important and they stay in high school and they get to college and they have a chance of success. I mean, so, you know, you, this is what's so important about what we do is we don't lose sight of any of that. Um, and so I, I love being a nonprofit because we can speak to it. So the model's like a win-win for everybody. We advance university technology. We make it a better deal for the founders to actually, you know, uh, be more successful both personally and financially. And we hopefully create an environment that'll in increase investment uh, by the investment community. How do you transition to, self, uh, to a self-sustaining status? If some of your enterprises are successful, do you take uh, some sort of a uh, ownership um, position so that, that, uh, that some of that success is, is contributed back to the nonprofit? Yes. Um, that was one important component of 
the model that we developed, and actually we had quite a bit of dialogue in getting our 501c3 status uh, with the IRS on, on that particular issue, is that whenever we fund um, a company, we can take equity in that company. Uh, we have a dialogue with uh, the organization, and if there's agreement that that's what they want to do, um, we have an equity interest in the company. Our idea is as we build our portfolio, hopefully in five to ten years, these companies will be successful, and that money will come any investment we make comes back to BioXL and then just creates an evergreen fund uh, for BioXL, for the state. Um, and so that to us was so important because, again, fundraising is hard. Investment is hard, that early stage investment. So if our model can actually get us self-sustaining and potentially to the point where we can even do more of that, more larger amounts of that early stage investing, it just gets better and better. And we've had some very interesting uh, responses to the model because as times have gotten tough, the first year it was all about the donors wanted to put money into social services and homeless and families and helping with mortgage and these one-time right. things. And totally understandable because the, you know, the nation was devastated. Recently what we've heard is donors love this model because it create, creates ongoing sustainability. And so the model creates an independent, um, you know, and a new economy and leverages significant federal assets. And so um, as some of the, the donors are starting to look at this model like in the tw last 12 months, we're getting a total turn on this because they're now finally understanding what we're trying to do and why it's important that philanthropic dollars go into this uh, valley of death space. Who is your board? Who are, how do you construct your board and, and who are your basic donors? So uh, we were lucky enough, as I said, to get started with a, a significant grant from Abraxas Bioscience. We've had local groups like Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Air, uh, Arizona Power Service, APS, contribute, individual donors. Um, we just, um, this is actually very, very exciting, we just in November um, worked with the city of Peoria locally um, to uh, take the BioXL model and in, embed it in a new uh, incubator that we're forming in uh, Peoria. It's called BioInspire, and it's dedicated to medical device development. Mm. So we chose medical devices because we felt that was focused. It um, was of a large interest these days in the healthcare issues. Many of the healthcare solutions are going to be uh, device-based. Um, shorter runway through the regulatory process, um, reimbursement a little bit easier. So we thought about all those things that the scientists and the founders run into, and they just invested um, significantly to create a facility to give us uh, funding for proof of concept and to do seed funding of companies in that uh, facility. And so that combined with what we're doing has been an important uh, contribution to what we're doing. So they like that because we're a nonprofit, and the any. Um, revenue and any benefit that we have goes back into a nonprofit and can go back into supporting the uh, facility again in a self-sustaining uh, model. Yesterday I just met with Blue Cross Blue Shield again about a partnership and focusing on you know what are the big problems that they face and can we work together to find technology to solve those problems. Our board is um, growing. So the first couple of years it was very small and that was based on um, our contract required uh, it be a smaller board. Uh, we've recently expanded. So we have um, James Powers who um, was CEO of iLink and just sold that company. So he was a local entrepreneur, created a couple companies, sold them, and really understood the difficulties facing small companies and why some a group like BioXL was so important. Um, Todd Davis, who is the CEO of um, uh, LifeLock, mm -hmm. which is uh, a really up-and-coming company that started, um, has grown, and uh, hopefully will, uh, you know, be advancing, um, you know, into a, an IPO one of these days. I mean, but uh, Todd's done a super job at uh, building that company, and and he really understands the venture world and what it takes. And so, having his expertise, um, you know. Uh, is really important. Um, Peter Slade just joined um, the board and Peter was actually the first um, CEO of AZTE out of ASU. He's an attorney, um, he's an entrepreneur, he set up, um, after he left AZTE, he set up a company in China, is now working with Israel, so he has international um, 
uh, experience. He's got, um, you know, the academic understanding, and he knows the venture world. Uh, Ioana Morphesis, who was the first um, CEO of GPEC um, and is known for economic development across the United States. Um, so I think. Oh, Carolee Nikolic, who is a scientist and entrepreneur um, that came out of Stanford and has uh, moved out. Uh, he was one of the early um, uh, uh, deal movers of Genentech and has created a couple small companies and just launched a new uh, company. So we're trying to get um, folks that really have been there, done that, understand it, that understand the venture world. And right now we've, we're looking to try to um, see if we can bring on somebody um, that's out of the venture community. And the city of Peoria, we actually created a, a different board for that. And in that board, we have gotten Medtronic uh, from industry because it's biomedical devices. We've gotten um, Enrico Picosa from um, HLM Partners in Boston as a venture capital um, person to be on that uh, group. And we've got a host of different folks that are on that advisory board, too. So between the two, we've got this focus on biomedical devices that we can draw on, and then we have our board that I mentioned. So. Well, what's interesting is that it, it adds a whole new set of tools to, uh, to economic development uh, efforts. Um, the traditional tool set that cities use of providing tax abatements um, is great if you are a large company, you already have huge revenue streams, you already have huge tax bills, and you can start um, negotiating for tax relief in order to make the investment. It changes the economics. I know that there are a lot of municipalities that are coming out of criticism or that are being criticized for these types of, uh, of deals nowadays. But it's one tool set. Mm -hmm. Small ventures do not have that ability. They're not That's earning right. anything. That's they right. have ideas. They have intellectual property and they frequently can't get investors yet. And what you're doing is you're saying in that no man's land or no woman's land between having an idea and being able to get funding you're going to step into the breach mm -hmm. it's interesting to me that you're also creating a board of people who are familiar with those gaps who can really sympathize with the and perhaps have overcome those those issues um, uh, uh, that, that entrepreneurs have had um, and are willing to also contribute not only their expertise but also their financial resources to that well, you know, it's really important because we aren't like a typical philanthropic organization. I mean, because we are a nonprofit, but in many respects we have to act like a, an early stage venture group where we're having to assess the technology, make tough business decisions, um, you know, stay hands on. Um, you, you have to have a board that understands that, that understands risk, that understands that we're going to have success, but that we may have to have a few failures before we get to success and that are willing to kind of push those boundaries and push the boundaries of you know what's you know what's typically expected out of a nonprofit like this whole idea of um, that we're going to invest in something that hopefully equity will come back and make BioXL self-sustaining, but also that somebody you know may uh, make a lot of money on, and that's okay. And investors and entrepreneurs understand that. And so uh, part of what we're doing is the model is to try to create a better understanding and a new understanding of, of what and how philanthropy can can be used. Um, Philanthropic capitalism, it's a term that's been out there. Venture philanthropy is one, but uh, we're using philanthropic capitalism. And one of the initiatives I just started was uh, creating a philanthropic capitalist network. We did a reception, get together, networking session, and it was made up of um, high net worth individuals, some local um, political folks, um, some industry. And what we did is we just introduced some of the companies and some of the technologies we were looking at. And we said, you know, if you really want to build a bio industry here in Arizona, you have to understand all of the pieces of that. Education, there's research, there's development, there's investment. So at the there's meeting, capital equipment, ever, there's yeah, facilities. I mean, there's real estate. There's there's all of these things. So we had them all around, and you said, you know, all of you need to play a role. Some of you may want to invest in the universities. That's fine. Some of you may want to invest in BioXL. Some of you may want to invest in these companies. Hopefully, some of you want to do all of that, you know, and that's good. But so we set up this network, and it was great. The night was a success. People that came said, "We want to stay connected. We loved hearing about the technology. We loved hearing about." 
who's who are the players and getting to meet and walk around and just talk to others and connecting. But with the idea of if we can build this philanthropic capitalist network, you know, we drive more philanthropy into this, but we also get an awareness of all of these potential downstream investors because as as good as I might be and as good as BioXL might be in getting these companies started, they still are going to have to have that downstream capital. I mean, NIH gives, what, 85 percent of its funding to the academic institutions. How do we make sure that that benefits the public, either through better drugs, devices, or jobs and new companies? Well, Marianne, thank you so much for developing this model of a nonprofit venture. And thank you for your insights. Oh, thank you for um, allowing me to share them with you. I really appreciate it.